Professor Atia is an old friend of uh, uh, this department and this university. He is a visiting member of uh, our IS, I guess, since two years ago. Oh, it's the first year, I think. Oh, okay, four, four years <laughs> ago. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, so, really, uh, he's an old friend and uh, does not need much introduction. Uh, of course, you all know that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, the uh, field's medalist uh, back to uh, many, many years ago, I guess, before some of you in this room were even... 1966. 66, right. So, some, <laughs> really before some of you here were born. And uh, he's also a winner of uh, the Abel Prize. Uh, uh, and these are, of course, the highest honors uh, in, uh, ma any mathematician can have. Uh, I'm not going to go through a long list of honors and titles that uh, uh, Professor Atia has. Uh, he's going to be giving us uh, uh, a series of three lectures. Uh, the general title is A Geometer Explores the Nucleus. And uh, uh, today is uh, his first lecture. So, welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you for the chance to talk again here at UST. Uh, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is some halfway between physics and mathematics. Well, partway. I'm not sure how close to physics it is. Um, I'm a mathematician, but I'm interested in physics. And in recent years, there's been a lot of interaction between physics and mathema mathematics, particularly between geometry and physics. And... Um, uh, physics, uh, the standard physics of uh, particles is very complicated theory, quantum theory, quantum field theory. Um, but it's sometimes useful to try to look at it more uh, in an elementary way. And I think with the new developments in geometry, it may be possible to get some new insights into physics, starting from a different point of view. So I'm going to try to present here some ideas of mine which are very speculative. They may be wrong. But they're trying to, to see, and some of it uses ideas used before, to see if one can learn more about physics from the point of view of modern geometry. So I'll start with a bit of background. Uh, this first lecture is entitled Skirmions, I'll explain what skirmions are. But <laughs> the relationship between physics and geometry um, there is, of course, the relationship between um, differential geometry and physics, which, because the equations of Einstein... Um, and Maxwell involved writing down expressions in, in different, differential calculus and geometry, the Yang-Mills equation, which are similar, more recent equations. And then that's, a, that's a, on the whole fairly well established. More recently, there's been discovered links between quantum mechanics and topology. This is more uh, recent and very exciting and lots of possibilities. And finally, it's been shown surprisingly that string theory, which is the most sophisticated form of modern day physics uses a lot of algebraic geometry, very classical algebraic geometry, but algebraic curves and surfaces and so on. So a large part of mathematics has been brought into present day physics. The, the so called standard model of physics is built on some groups U1, SU2, SU3, which are supposed to describe different forces in physics. U1 corresponds to the electromagnetic field, SU2 is what's called the weak force. SU3 is what's called the strong force. The strong force is the strongest of all the forces in nature. It's the one that binds the nucleus together. What stops, I mean, for example, as you know, the nucleus has a lot of protons. Protons are electrically charged. Uh, they would normally repel each other, but they are bound together by a stronger force, which is stronger than the electromagnetic force. And that's the force that holds the nucleus together. So that's the one that I'm going to be sort of trying to talk about. Now, the a classical picture of the nucleus of an atom is that it has made up of protons and neutrons. Um, and the protons and uh, neutrons are very similar. They have a mass which is very close. And one of the mysteries is why they're so close, but yet they're different. Uh, and the proton has an electric charge, uh, and the neutron has no electric charge, it's neutral. Um, and both together, both protons and neutrons, are called baryons. That's a word for a genetic object which makes up the nucleus. Uh, now, in quantum mechanics, these, this is not the final story. 
protons and neutrons are made up of even smaller things. The smaller things are called quarks. I won't say much about quarks, just to tell you there are quarks, and the quarks come in many different kinds. There are things called up quarks and down quarks and so on. And the, the basic elementary part of it is that the proton is made up of three quarks, and the neutron is made up of three quarks. And the proton, I, I hope I've got it the way around, might be the other way around. Uh, two of them are, are two down and one up for, for make the proton, two up and one down for the neutron. They're very similar, and they're the other way around. <coughs> and the important thing about quarks is that they, they're never seen outside the nucleus. They're inside the nucleus. They're something very mysterious. And the charge, the charges of, of uh, quarks are, the charge of a proton is, and charge of the electron, these are units. They're sort of, all, everything in nature has an electrical charge, is a multiple of the charge of the electron with positive or negative integer multiplicity. So the proton is plus one, neutron is zero. But inside the proton, neutron, these quarks, they have a fractional charge, like a third. They're three times them is an integer. And that's because there are three of them, so to speak. Now, the, the, this is all very mysterious. It's complicated. I won't say much more now. Later on, I'll try to say something about it. But these are the fundamental things of which everything else is supposed to be built up, and yet they are mysterious because you can't see them. They're hidden inside the nucleus. So it's a very sophisticated, mysterious theory. <clears throat> now, let me say a little bit about topology of physics. The first place <coughs> in which topology enters physics <coughs> is exactly in connection with the fact I mentioned that the charge of every particle that occurs is always an integer multiple of the <coughs> charge of the electron. <coughs> and the question is, why is this true? It's a very mysterious fact. You don't get anything with a charge of half or uh, decimal, fra irrational number, always integer multiples. This is, when physicists meet something that comes in integer multiples, they say it's quantized, it comes in, quant in, in units. And Dirac, more than 50 years ago, gave a topological explanation why this should be so. I won't give you the details of it, but the idea was that if you had, in, in, in Maxwell's equations, we describe existing magnetism, there are electric charges, like, like an electron. Theoretically, they're supposed to be magnetically charged things, which would be called monopoles. They don't actually exist. That You get dipoles, but a monopole is theoretically possible. And Dirac said, if you have a monopole somewhere, and you look at how an uh, electrically charged particle will move in the neighborhood of a monopole, then you find that there is some topology which... Uh, explains the quantization of the electric charge. I'll try to describe it here, but basically it's related to the most famous piece of topology, uh, most elementary piece of topology, which I'll try to say a few words about. It comes from the following fact that you, you think of the two-dimensional sphere and you think of the three-dimensional sphere, that's the unit sphere in four dimensions. And that is rather remarkably a map from the three-dimensional sphere to the two-dimensional sphere. So the inverse image of each point is a circle, and as you go around the two sphere, these circles move around inside the three sphere. And you would think, therefore, that, that would make the three sphere just the t product of the two sphere and the circle. But that's not the case. These circles inside here are twisted. And what happens is every, any two circles are actually linked, have linking number one. It's a very remarkable configuration. If you project the three, space, three sphere onto the three-dimensional space, you can draw it in three-dimensional space. You can see a lot of lines circles forming this configuration. Every circle links every other circle like, like two links in three-dimensional space. This was actually discovered by a rather famous mathematician called Clifford in the 19th century, who died rather young, a very bright, brilliant man, and nowadays more commonly referred to as Hopf until, and after the uh, Swiss mathematician, or Heinz Hopf. Um, <clears throat> but it, 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 it is the beginning of modern topology in many ways, the fact that you can have this remarkable... I've written this... You, in terms of algebra, it's easy to describe how it happens. You take a complex number, a pair of complex numbers, uh, Z1, Z2, uh, which are on the unit sphere, mod Z1 squared square equals 1, and you associate to such a pair um, the ratio, Z1, Z2, as a, as a pair of homogeneous coordinates for the complex relative line. In other words, two points give the same answer, if they differ by a non-zero factor. 
uh, and the two-dimensional, quantum-dimensional predictive line is the complex numbers with the point of infinity added to the sphere. And so by associating every point um, mod equals one on the three sphere, the point in the predictive line, you get this map. The inverse image of each point is precisely the ambiguity in the phase that you can multiply by the complex number of absolute value one that would relate these two. If you require everything to lie on the sphere, then lambda has to be of the form e to the i theta. This is the proof. It's very simple, but if you think about the geometry, it's quite deep. Um, now, this linking number, the fact that two in, these two terms are link, and the linking number it can be either one or two, depending on the situation, that is where the uh, integrality of electric charge comes from, according to Dirac. So that's, that's old. Then much, more, much later, well, not much later, then the Dirac of the 1920s, this perhaps was the 1940s, um, Skirm, who was an English physicist, um, he proposed a model of the nucleus, which is given by a bit of ge geometry. I won't explain the back physical background, but mathematically, the idea is you consider three-dimensional space, and you consider a function in three-dimensional space whose values lie in the group SU2, that's the group of unitary 2 by 2 matrices with determinant 1, which is the same thing, really, as a three-dimensional sphere. Um, and to associate every point x, f of x in the sphere, and you require asymptotically that when you go very far away, all the values of x converge to the unit matrix. Um, and then if you have such a function, then Skirm wrote down a function or an expression which will be sort of representing some kind of energy. Um, and the, the, his model of the nucleus will be a function which minimizes this energy. That would give you the configuration of least energy which is described a static, stable nucleus. And the, the function is quite a simple function. On the one hand, it's part of two, some of two terms. You integrate over three-dimensional space, and what you integrate, the first term I've written like that is the norm squared of the differential, the differential of the map. At any point maps the tangent space to R3, to the tangent space to SU2, where you have in each case a Euclidean metric. You just take the sum of the squares of all the entries of the matrix that describes the differential, the Jacobian. And that's the L2 norm. Uh, and then you integrate that over space with some coefficient outside. And then you do something similar here, which is dual. This is the expression that measures the length. But in three dimensions, lengths and areas are dual. In dimensions three, you have zero, one, two, three. One and two are dual. So you, you, you have to put in a term here which is exactly the same as this, but it repla repla replaces the, the matrix of three by three partial derivatives by the, what's called the adjoint matrix, where you take the two by two minors and make another matrix, which measures the area. And you put another coefficient in. And the, the function he put out was this. The reason you need to do this is that in two dimensions, this is a very standard function. One uses energy. But um, in three dimensions, the scaling is different. If you rescale, then depending on which term you've got, sometimes they decrease and sometimes they increase. In the middle dimension, nothing would happen. But this one is just below the middle, and this one just above the middle. So these two terms go in different directions. So they balance each other up, and it's possible to get a solution which minimizes it. If you didn't have this term, then everything will either collapse to a point or else it will go off to infinity. So you have to have two terms like this in three dimensions. Um, because the, you assume that the function goes to one at infinity, then you can sort of think of compactifying the three-dimensional space to a sphere of dimensional three by adding a point to infinity on this side. And then you get a map, which I call F bar, which is a map from the three-dimensional sphere to the three-dimensional sphere. And just like a map of a circle to a circle has a winding number, the number of times it goes round, or well, the map of the two-dimensional sphere covers the two-dimensional sphere the number of times it covers it, in the same way, a map of a three-dimensional sphere to a three-dimensional sphere covers it a certain number of times. That number is always an integer. It can be positive or negative or zero, but it's an integer. So that, that's called the degree of the map. It's true in any dimension. That's one of the most fundamental topological invariants you can get. And Skirm identified this with the baryon number, the number of protons and neutrons together. So the most important physical quantities, the electric charge and the baryon number, are identified topologically. So that's already a very big link between geometry and physics. 
I'm not going to use those. I mean, that's some way that's my, my, my purpose is, as far as possible, to build on that. Now, there's another idea which is important. It's been very important in mathematics in, in recent years, uh, which occurs in many, many different parts of mathematics. Those are what are called solitons. Now, a soliton was discovered, again, probably about 50 years ago, partly by accident, been enormous development since in a whole range of different applications in geometry and in various forms of applied mathematics. And what they are is f there's something in between a point and a wave. If you, really, there, you take some nonlinear differential equation which, have, which has a solution. For example, like this would be the um, Skirm functional when you look at the order of Lagrange equations, it gives you a differential equation. You try and solve that to get the solution. And the solution is then some kind of function on the space, which is uh, localized. It tends to be zero far out, localized near some peak, maybe more than one point. And it behaves like a particle in the sense that it's very stable. And if somehow you collide some of these things, after the collision, you still see the individual objects. So, you see, in classical mechanics, elementary mechanics, you think about points. That's a bit idealized. You may replace these by a billiard ball, colliding by banging against each other. But they are very hard, and they are inside and the outside are different. These um, solitons are a smoothed out version of billiard balls. They, they, the, the billiard ball and the outside world belong together in the same equation. There's no discontinuity of the boundary, but they behave as though they were billiard balls bouncing around in some way. Quite a complicated way, and that will depend on the particular problem. And these solitons have a very, very rich theory makes them very good um, models for particles. That's why they were called solitons. The solitary waves, the waves which are so isolated, they can travel as well. Uh, and like a proton is a particle, electron is a particle, neutron. So a soliton was coined as a word for a model of a, some kind of particle. It could be any kind of particle. It, could be, it originally occurred in water waves. It could occur in electrical signals in optic nerve cut fibers. It can occur as a model for, uh, for protons and so on. So these are very important things in mathematics. Now, usually the equations that you want to solve to find them are very complicated and you can't actually solve them exactly and you have to do a lot of complicated numerical calculations. But for certain classes of, of such problems, it was discovered very remarkably that they are integral. You can solve them explicitly. So these are very beautiful things and a lot of work has done uh, recent decades about solitons because they are such remarkable things. They have, you can solve them explicitly and you find exactly what happens with all the collision processes and so on. Now these are the simplest ones that were discovered were in, in, in sort of two dimensions, one space and one time. As a, something, for example, the first one, the KDV equation, described the motion of a, a sort of lump of water in a small in a channel as it moved down the channel and you had a lump that was a moving soliton. Um, but in more dimensions, in four-dimensional space-time, which is where we live, um, there are, uh, the skirmion is an example of a soliton there, but now the differential equations can't really be solved. Nobody knows how to solve them. You can write them down, do some calculations on them, but in principle they're very difficult to solve. But on the other hand, there are some problems in four-dimensional space-time which have soliton behavior which is soluble. These are ones which have a very beautiful theory which is due to Roger Penrose, you've probably heard of, uh, and uh, he has something called twi his twister theory. And Penrose's twister theory is a beautiful way of using analysis and algebra to solve certain classes of problems which arise of the soliton type. <coughs> Those are not, the skirmion is not one, not, a, not one of these, but well, one thing I should mention is this, in the skirm model, there is no distinction between protons and neutrons. They're all treated the same. The electric charge doesn't enter in, into that theory. And what I'm going to talk about is something beyond skirmions, but at the level of skirmions, you forget about electric charge. You're only interested in baryon number. Now, if you look at the baryon number one, that's the fundamental object, the proton or the neutron, uh, you can look at it as a function. It's a function on space with values in the group. You can see, uh, now this time, you, 
since you look for one particle, you look for a spherically symmetrical solution. You think of it looking like a ball, a billiard ball. So you impose spherical symmetry onto the differential equations. That reduces you to an ordinary differential equation, which is, of course, much easier to solve. That's a function of the radius. Uh, and then you can do that numerically, and you get a nice graph, and you put that together, you'll get a picture like this. This will be a nice bump. This will be what your proton looks like in this model. Um, but if you take already barrier number two and ask what the solution looks like, it's extremely difficult to find out. Uh, if you just try to do it by brute force, because the, the, you're multi-dimensions, it's a complicated problem, it's almost impossible to look at it directly, so it's very hard to find out. So a lot of work has gone into finding indirect ways to study skirmions. And what I'll try to outline here is what I call the strategy to study skirmions. The first thing was uh, an analogy with some models which are integrable. And what, the ones I'm talking about are what are called non-abelian magnetic monopoles. They are very much like the Dirac monopole, but slightly more complicated. Um, and these ones have been studied a lot, and uh, some physicists thought they looked there somehow some similarity, not in detailed formulae, but in sort of innate natural behavior. There were some numbers which corresponded to topological quantities like baryon number, they, 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 they had similar features. So the idea was to use this and try to guess from that what you could do about skirmions. So that using this and numerical work, then they got in, you get information about the skirmions, which turned out to give at least the small values of the barrier number, quite good pictures of what the system looks like. For example, when B is equal to 2, it turns out that you might think that if it's B equals 1, you get a sphere. You might think when B equals 2, you would get a larger sphere, twice as big. Uh, well, it is true you can get a solution with twice as, which is spherically symmetric with twice the sphere, but that solution is not stable. It's like trying to put one ball on top of the other one, it falls off. And then you get something different. And when it settles down, what you get is a ring-shaped thing. You get something which is where the, it is concentrated in a ring around the, with a hole in the middle. It has axial symmetry perpendicular to the ring, but not spherical symmetry. So that's the case of B equal to 2, and that's a rather surprising fact. It comes out that it's true for the other models, which can be solved explicitly. That leads you to guess that it might be true for the skirmion. You try it out, and you find numerical solutions. Then even more surprisingly, it turned out that with some of the other numbers, like B equal to 3, you find that you get a solution which has tetrahedral symmetry. It looks it has some other, like the symmetries of a regular tetrahedron. And for B equal 7, it turned out you even get icosahedral symmetry, that of an icosahedron. And you wonder why 3 is related to 4, and why 7 is related to 12. The answer is that one number is, N is 2B minus 2. The barrier number is B, then the number of vertices of the um, regular solid is given by this formula 2b minus 2. So b is equal to 3. Uh, 2 times 3 minus 2 is 4. That's the tetrahedron. If b is 7, 2 times 4 is 14. Minus 2 is 12. Is the number of vertices of uh, the <coughs> icosahedron pit or, the, or its dual. So now, that was the strategy. And in the, so the strategy was to compare them, the skirmions, with these things called magnetic monopoles. So let me tell you very quickly what, a, what these monopoles are, uh, because that's all sort of part of the story in many ways. The idea was that, that um, now in modern physics, people use uh, what mathematicians call collections for a fiber bundle, and what physicists call a gauge field. So it's uh, lo locally given by uh, differential form, with values in the Lie algebra or matrices of that group. Um, and um, the monopole equations involve two things. First of all, a connection A, and then a section of what's called the adjoint bundle. That's the bundle whose fiber is the Lie algebra. So that's, the, some, that's a, a vector with values in, the, in these matrices. The matrices, Lie algebra, are the 2 by 2 skew emission matrices with trace 0. Uh, they have three components. So this is a three-component vector. And this is a sort of certain matrix. Uh, <coughs> and an asymptotic condition, again, that says something about what happens at infinity, that the length of this vector goes to one at infinity. And that guarantees the system has sort of finite energy. The energy I won't write down, but it's something 
there's a natural energy function here, which is so you might think of as analogous to the skirm function, and the monopole solutions you're looking for with the things that minimize the this energy function, and the equation you get by minimizing them is it's neither a nice equation, it's called the Bogomolny equation. Now, by the way, before I do that, over on the side here, I pointed out that the this condition that phi goes to 1 and infinity means that you have a topological invariant, which is again a degree. Well, at infinity, and you're in three-dimensional space, infinity is a large two-dimensional sphere, then that gets mapped into the unit sphere in the three-dimensional Lie algebra, the, three, the matrices. So that's a two-dimensional sphere too. And therefore that has a winding number of degree. That is identified as the magnetic charge. In this case, the topological quantity is called the magnetic charge. And these things are then called monopoles because they have magnetic charge. Um, but they're called non-abelian monopoles because instead of having U1, the, which is what Dirac's equation would involve, these are more complicated We have they have the SU2 group. But unlike, see, the Dirac monopole, if you think of it at all, physically, is a point singularity, like a, a point with infinite mass, of electric charge, constantly at one point, is mathematically singular, physically not very realistic, have something infinitely charged. But the, the beauty about these non-abelian monopoles is that they are solitons. They don't have infinite charge. They're smooth everywhere. But they look like a direct monopole. If you go very far away, you get a magnetic field. So they replace the... And this was a great discovery of physicists some years back, that you could replace the singular solutions of the ordinary simple theory by a smooth soliton solution. And if you went from the ordinary case of abelian theories to not be, if you had matrices, in other words. So that's why they're, they're so they had, so solitons, these are solitons of a special kind, coming from these theories. So in this equation, which is the Bogomolny equation, the equation just says that the curvature of this, of this connection A, which is called the field strength, is the dual, in three dimensions, one form and two forms are dual, so uh, this is a two form, this dual is one form, and its dual is what's called the covariant derivative of the, uh, Higgs field, it's called the Higgs field phi. This is the equation that says, uh, that is the Bogomolly equation, which guarantees the minimal energy of this configuration. Which, and of course, solutions which differ by some changes of variable called gauge transformations are regarded as equ equ equivalent. Now, in, uh, unlike the case of the skirmion, um, well, <coughs> the solutions which you get, they have constant energy, and the energy energy is actually some fixed multiple like pi or something like that, times this number k, which is the magnetic charge. So that tells you how much, so the, what the total norm squared of the field strength is. This has been extensively studied by Twister methods, and it gives rise to explicit solutions, as, as I've said. Now, unlike the case of skirmions, um, there, is no, there, is, there is no unique solution. The solution actually can have, has parameters. In the situation, you can have monopoles in different positions. And so there's a, what's called a, a moduli space, a parameter space that describes all possible solutions. And the number of solu so solutions, in fact, goes up with the number k. If your number is k is 1, then the only, only possibility is that you have this, this, this uh, spherically symmetric solution. But that's, that can be spherically symmetric by any point in space. That gives you 3 degrees of freedom. In addition to that, there are rather more subtle angular phase, which I won't bother to go into, so that the all the space of parameters is four-dimensional. Four it's just the product of R3 times the circle, rather not, not very interesting. <coughs> but in general, whenever you get this four-dimensional space, for any number k, the parameter space is 4k-dimensional. You count it right. And the, moreover, it has a natural Riemannian metric which comes from the geometry, which is more or less related to the kinetic energy term uh, in the system. And... This metric has a very remarkable property. It's what's called a hyperkähler metric. Now, it's a fancy word, but what it means is the following. You know about the quaternions, famous system of numbers discovered by Hamilton in the 19th century. You have real numbers, you have complex numbers, and then you have quaternions. In the real numbers, you have 1, the multiples of 1. In the complex numbers, you have 1 and i. i squared is minus 1. In the quaternions, you have i, j, and k. i squared, j squared, k squared, all minus 1. But more importantly, i and j anti-commute. i, j is equal to k. And the quaternions are 
Non-commutative algebra was the first example of non-commutative algebra in mathematics. But anyway, the, the, these and the Cotonians, the um, well, they're, they're, they're a very important part of algebra in general. Um, and the hyperkähler manifold is a manifold. If you have the real manifold, it's a manifold where you just have different. You can just look at tangent space, it's a flat space, and uh, if it has a metric, it's just like a Euclidean metric. Euclidean space. If the manifold is complex, then at every point you'll have a multiplication by i. So that, like the complex plane, you can have real axis multiplied by i, get imaginary axis. The quaternions have an i, j, and a k. So that means that the, quater- the vector tangent space at any point looks like a k-dimensional vector space over the quaternions. has dimension 4k. And these multiplications by i, j, and k are what are called covariant constant. As you move around, to parallel transport them around, they are preserved. They, they satisfy some strong conditions. Now, the, the one, so this, this MK means the mono, moduli space of the solutions of this thing. If M1 is just this ordinary product, three space times a circle, so the first interesting case is M2. And uh, we throw away, we, we factor, you always factor off, so to speak, the center of mass and look at the, what's left. What's left has dimensions four less. So M, M2 would have dimension eight, but I put a little zero to mean you fix the center of mass so that you're only concerned with the relative positions of two objects. That has dimension four. Now, this is a very special manifold, uh, and it has very remarkable properties. It's hyperkähler of dimension four. And dimension four, that's the same saying as saying it satisfies the Einstein equations, and also is a complex Kähler manifold, which is very strong condition, <coughs> and it has zeros. It's a very remarkable manifold. Moreover, it has rotational symmetry. <coughs> the, the whole situation is des- described in three-dimensional space. The solution to a problem which is in three-dimensional space. <coughs> Therefore, the, the group of motions of Euclidean space uh, has to preserve the equations. Thank you very much. And so... It acts on the space of parameter solutions. If you have one solution, rotate, you'll get another solution. And that preserves all the properties. <coughs> so this is a manifold which satisfies a very strong system of differential equations, has remarkable symmetry, and as a result of that, it's unique. There's no, it is the only manifold with these properties. I started this manifold many years ago with Nigel Hitchin. We wrote it down, you write it down in next solutions. It's quite complicated, it involves elliptic functions but it's entirely determined by these properties. Nothing else is needed. It's the only one such that has these properties. If you ask want to know what this manifold looks like topologically, don't worry about the metric. It's actually quite simple. If you take the... Uh, <coughs> well, there are two models of the manifold. I won't, I won't always distinguish between them. It turns out this manifold has a double covering. It's not, it's not simply connected. And whether I talk about one upstairs or downstairs, I won't be too, too precise. Now... The, the one upstairs looks like the following. Take the complex vector plane, that's like the complex vector line, but one dimension more, so given by three homogeneous coordinates up to a factor, and remove from it the real vector plane, where all the real coordinates are real. And when you get left is an open set. And then <coughs> that's the manifold of this, what this manifold looks like. In other words, it's a manifold which is not closed, it's not compact, it goes off to, to infinity. Infinity is this bit here over here. You can, if you this, go down below the one, <coughs> two, the one before you take the double sheeted covering, then that can be described another way. Take the four-dimensional sphere, and inside that, there is a copy of the real objective plane, and remove that. I'll, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And this two-sheeted covering is the one that you get by uh, mapping every point up here to its complex conjugate. In that, the real points are fixed. <coughs> so if you le- left the real points in, <coughs> this will be bra- <coughs> a branched covering. When you remove the real points, it's unbranched covering. So let me say a little bit more about the geometry of this little piece of uh, this manifold. Let, let me start this way now. I'll start with some algebra. Start off <coughs> with... The four-dimensional sphere is the unit sphere in five-dimensional space. But think of that five-dimensional space as the following. 
Think of it as a space of three by three symmetric real matrices with trace zero. Yeah. I left that out. Um, three by three symmetric matrices. Well, that, not, you count the number of parameters: three on the diagonal, uh, three above the diagonal, <coughs> six. Uh, then the others you get by reflection. Take away one, some, the trace is zero. Five. So five-dimensional real space parameterizes by the symmetric matrices trace zero. Inside there, you put take the unit sphere. The unit sphere inside the matrices can be thought of as putting the norm squared equal to one. The norm squared is the trace of t squared. A symmetric matrix has eigenvalues. It has three eigenvalues. Let's call them lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, in that order. And the trace being 0 means that the sum of the lambda i is 0. The norm squared being 1 says that the sum of the squares is equal to 1. So there's really only one free parameter left. And they vary uh, with this parameter. There are two extremes, one where lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, and the other one is where lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3. Otherwise, they're all distinct. Now, the rotation group, SO3, acts on these by just the obvious equation for matrices. And <coughs> two um, I, um, matrices are on the same orbit of the group, if and only if they have the same eigenvalues. The eigenvalues parameterize the invariance of a symmetric matrix under orthogonal transformation. So there are two special orbits, which is when the two eigenvalues are equal. And the other ones, where the, the other orbits are all three dimensional. Uh, the the general, generic orbit is the group of rotations divided by the diagonal subgroup of order 4. But the two special orbits are copies of the real objective plane. They are <coughs> easy to see. So, in, so this gives you a decomposition of the four-dimensional sphere, you see, um, under in this way. You see two copies of the real objective plane. One with the, two, the first two eigenvalues are equal. The other one with the other two values are equal. And in between, lots of copies of three dimensional orbits in between. Uh, a nice uh, division into S4. That's the, that's the sort of picture of S4 that's relevant for, our, for our, what I've just been saying before. Because if you start with the complex objective plane and you map it to the four dimensional sphere, which I said you do by taking quotienting out by complex conjugation, what happens is in, in the complex objective plane, well, first of all, the real objective plane gets fixed by this map because the points of complex conjugate are equal. That gives you one copy of RP2 in there. Think of it as the one at infinity of the North Pole. But there's another copy, totally disjoint, given by the equation of the conic, sigma zi squared equal to zero. That's an equation that obviously has no real solutions in the objective plane. It's totally imaginary conic. So that you have in the plane here, you have the real points over there, you have the imaginary conic over here. When you factor out by the complex involution, that's fixed. This one, you get the antipodal map, because every point z, you take the complex conjugate on this sphere here, that's the antipodal map. So when you quotient out the sphere by the antipodal map, what you get is the real objective plane. And that's the other copy of the real objective plane. So in this big four sphere, these two objective planes, one comes from the conic, one comes from the real objective plane. Uh, it's slightly asymmetrical, and I'll, you'll see later on. We can do, so, so, so it's a very nice, simple bit of geometry, but it's, it's rather, rather important, and I think for what I have to say, rather, rather uh, helpful. Now, uh, let, me, let me jump a bit. How do we relate, why are these monopoles that I talked to you about, why were they supposed to be related to skirmions? Um, uh, except for the fact that skirmions and monopoles both were solitons and they both had a topological number called the, the baryon number or the magnetic charge. Uh, you know, it's a bit vague what is the relationship between them. But there is a way of making a relationship. And that relationship uses what are called instantons. Now, instantons are also solitons, but they are solitons in four dimensions, not three. And they come around in the following way. They come from physics, too. On four-dimensional space, you now again look at um, SU2 connections, A. Again, you take the norm, L2 norm 
of the uh, curvature. It's called the Yang-Mills functional. In four dimensions, because this is in the middle dimension, it's conform conformally invariant. And so if it's finite, it tends to extend to the fourth sphere. So you get, you can compactify all this problem to the four-dimensional sphere. And then you get, uh, on the four-dimensional sphere, you get topologically an SU2 bundle on the fourth sphere, and such bundles are classified by a topological invariant, in, integer invariant 2. Well, actually, it's what's called the second Chern class. Since I'm in Chinese territory, I should acknowledge Chern's contribution. Uh, and also, also called the Pontryagin class. Is that. Um, now, that, that's a topo bit of topology. On the four-dimensional sphere, you can have a two-dimensional uh, SU2 group go goes round, and it so does it in a non-trivial way, which is the analog of the way a circle can go around a two-sphere in a non-trivial way to give you the three-sphere, which corresponds to the first Chern class. This corresponds to the second Chern class. Um, on the other hand, if you want to use differential forms and things, you can write it down the following way. The, uh, in four dimensions, a two-form, differential two-form, can be decomposed into what are called self-dual and anti-self-dual. In four dimensions, duality replaces two and two. Are the same. They're both, they're comp the dimension of dual to two is two. So the duality operator, so-called star operator of Hodge, which basically replaces two directions by the orthogonal two directions, acts on two forms, and you can really look at the two forms that are preserved by that action and those which go into their opposite. The, the star operator has square one, there's two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one, so F plus and minus are the two eigenspaces. You can apply that differential forms, but you can also apply it to the curvature, which is two form with values in some group, some matrix group, matrices. Uh, so the angle functional can actually be broken up into two pieces. You can run it to the sum of the squares, of the self-dual part and the anti-self-dual part. And then it turns out this topological invariant K, essentially the second Chern class, uh, is essentially the difference of these two. So the difference is topological. The total amount gives you the energy. And if you want to minimize the energy, suppose the that these number integer K is positive. Obviously, if you, minimize, if you put F minus equal to zero, it's clear that you've minimized the energy. You get just the least value it can be, which is this constant times k. Uh, conversely, if the integer was negative, you would uh, make the other the plus, plus part zero. And instanton is just a solution of these self-dual equations. It's where it's f minus equal to zero, and it minimizes this quantity. Um, and this, um, again, ha uh, has a moduli space. It depends on uh, parameters. And this time, the dimension is 8n instead of 4n. And again, the metric is a special class of hyperkähler metric. If we use, if we base it on the metric on R4, if we base it on the metric of the four sphere, you get a slightly different metric. But we can use the metric on R4, and then you get a hyperkähler metric on this space too. So these instantons look very similar to monopoles, and in fact, there is a, a relationship that between they, they are the link really between the skirmions and the monopoles. That I want to talk about, but before doing that. First of all, in R4 or S4, the twister theory works very well and leads you to explicit solutions about these equations and tells you what this moduli space is. So, again, we know a lot, lot about this space. Now, let me just digress. This red paragraph is really going off in a different direction, but it's very important. If you work on any oriented four-dimensional manifold, uh, then you can define, with a, with a Riemannian metric, you can define instantons. And you can define the analog of these moduli spaces MK, but now based on the manifold in question, not on flat space. Simon Donaldson used these internal moduli spaces to find new differential topological invariants of the underlying manifold which do not depend on the metric you use. You write down the equations depending on the metric, you find the moduli space, you find some information about the topology of that space that does not change when you change the metric. And these were then very spectacular new discoveries which opened up the door of four-dimensional manifold theory. It shows four dimensions are very different from two dimensions or three dimensions. For example, one of the Donaldson's spectacular results was the following, that if you consider algebraic surfaces, so algebraic curves of the complex numbers give you a Riemann surface. Algebraic surfaces give you a real numbers for four-dimensional manifolds. Um, and what he proved was that 
you see, if you take a Riemann surface, we know that a Riemann surface is really a lot of tor- tori glued together. It's just something with a lot of holes in it. A torus with one hole is an elliptic curve, a curve of genus 1. A torus with two holes is a curve of genus 2, and so on. Every curve, algebraic curve, is one of these. And you can think of every algebraic curve topologically as being built up by just gluing together uh, elliptic curves, tor- tori. Or if you like cutting it in half, you can decompose into two parts. Donald says in algebraic surfaces, that can never happen. Basically, the algebraic surfaces, some minor, I won't go into the details, basically, the algebraic surfaces are indecomposable. Totally different from what happens for curves, and totally unexpected, and not at all determined by the topology. It depends on the differentiable structure. It's a very, very subtle theory. And this was a great, one of the greatest um, discoveries of the last part of the 20th century. The ideas coming from physics led to this. But I'm going to leave that aside, except to tell you that incidents are important in this whole game. Now, the solutions of the self dual yang mills equation on R4, if you just write down the equations in four dimensions and suppose they're independent of one variable, then obviously you'll get an equation for something in three dimensions. It turns out what you get are the Bogomolny equations. So the Bogomolny equations in three dimensions are just the what's called dimensional reduction of the yang mills equations in four dimensions. And the same methods work for both. The Twister method applies to both. So if you like, formally, a monopole can be thought of as an instanton in four-dimensional space, but because of its translation invariance, it would have infinite instanton number. On the other hand, if you do this, something, instead of doing that, instead of looking at solutions in R4, which are invariant under translation, turn R4 into the fourth sphere, and look at the solutions on the fourth sphere, which are invariant under a rotation. Or you can take a rotation in R4, if you like. So if you look at instances on the invariant under a rotation, then the situation is quite different. Because you're factoring out this time by a circle, instead of by an infinite line, uh, everything is much more finite. What happens is the following, that you get, the instances can be described now as monopoles. Um, well, but before I do that, I should say that if you have a on the four, four sphere, a rotation, a rotation, then you have a fixed two sphere. The axis is rotation. If you're in R4, take R, R2 here, R2 there, rotate in this plane, this plane is fixed. Put it on a sphere, that becomes a sphere. So the fixed points of the circle action are a two sphere. And if you've got a, a bundle which is acted on by this circle, over a fixed point, the circle has to act on the fibers. The fibers are two-dimensional complex vector spaces, really. So when it acts on the fiber, it breaks it up into a uh, rotation, one, certain weight one way, and certain rate, weight the other way, r- weight being the number of times the rotation goes around. And so the integer weight that you associate to these six points, which is an important part of the description of these um, invariant instantons. And you get a topological formula, which is written here, which says that the instanton, instanton number now, instead of being infinite, is actually just given by twice the product of the magnetic charge and this weight P. So those are, that's the sort of relationship between them. And now, <coughs> uh, now this, the, uh, in the case of monopoles, there's always this uh, limiting value, phi infinity, which we normalize to be 1 in the Euclidean case. In general, it's a number which is some integer. And in this, these examples, that number is actually this integer p. And in hyperbolic space, sorry, I haven't quite got there yet, um, what you get when you quote it down by a circle, if you're looking, looking at it carefully, is not flat space, but is a space of constant negative curvature. It's hyperbolic space. And the curvature of hyperbolic space turns out to be late, related to this number p, and it's, I think it's something like minus 1 over p squared. So for fix, fix p, you get a curvature minus 1 over p squared, and that p is an integer parameter, and for cur- curvature of this value, then the monopoles on this hyperbolic space, which are defined exactly the same way as before, they can be thought of as instantons in four dimensions invariant under a circle. And those can be solved explicitly. And then you can examine what happens when p goes to infinity, and these things will then converge. The, the hyperbolic space will converge to flat space, and these will then converge to or, uh, corresponding monopoles in um, flat space. So the, this is the quick summary of the way in which um, 
Um, well, I haven't quite finished that yet. Uh, I'm trying, and that relates uh, instantons in four dimensions, dividing by a circle, to, to monopoles in hyperbolic space. And then <coughs> uh, the, the last thing I should do is to relate those to skirmions. Um, I didn't do that, did I? I left that out. Uh, Well, I should. I should I should, let me let me try to describe that. Um, go back to the four-dimensional space picture. I think you've got a bundle in the four-dimensional space with a connection with group SU two. We're distinguishing the vertical direction from the horizontal direction. You have one vertical direction here and three here. If you come down the vertical direction and you have one of these connections, what you can do is to do parallel transport by the connection. And when you from the beginning to the end, that parallel transport is some element of the group. So what you've basically got is an element of the group associated with every point in R3. That's a map of R3 into the group. So that way, with every instanton, or every, every bundle with connection, you get a skirm field, a map into the group. And that's the link between the instanton problem and the skirm problem. And that link uh, is a topological link, is a geometrical link, uh, to what extent it, it, it compares well with the actual energy functions is a much more complicated story, but that's the way which we're going to start to get, get information about the skirm fields from these ones which we can solve. The instantons naturally give you ones down below, uh, which give you the, the map into the group, and then you, 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 you skillfully manipulate these to get what information you can. So that's the... Um, what I'm trying to summarize for you there is quite a lengthy story, and it's probably. But let me try to summarize what, what I was trying to, to say. The Skirm model is a model for the nucleus. Just and it ignores the electric charge. It tries to, and the, the topological quantity involved is the baryon number. Um, if you want to get an understanding of what the, these configurations look like, which minimize the energy, which describes it as ecstatic. Um, nuclei, um, then you have to solve those equations. We can't solve them directly, but we can solve another equation of equations which are closely related. Uh, and these came in two forms. There were the instantons and there were the monopoles. Uh, but they were, they were related in several ways. And putting all that together and using the fact that you can solve these inston monopole equations explicitly by these beautiful methods of twister theory, you can put all that together and actually get some useful results about skirmions. And those results I told you at the beginning, telling you what its shape was, there was this torus symmetry, there were these tetrahedral symmetry. That all came out of this sort of work. So the skirm approach has been quite uh, useful, given quite a lot of information about the geometry of these uh, uh, solutions. And it has, on, en route, it has somehow made a link between the skirmions and these other things instantons and magnetic monopoles, which seem to have some mathematical, physical meaning of their own. Magnetic monopoles were brought in because they were analogous to the Dirac monopoles, which were electric charts. I mean, there is a lot of physical background in the things we used, which, if you like, is just an accident. Mathematically, they were convenient, but as I shall try to show later on, it's more, it's more, in my view, it's more than an accident. There is some, I want to extract more connection between the mathematics and the physics. This was a bit which is a rather mathematical link. Uh, the Skirm is a model. These instances is another model. Uh, it happens that they have physical interpretations, but they're quite different. And we use the models just to help us solve the mathematical problem. But <laughs> I want then, to my subsequent lectures, to pursue that in a different way. But let me first of all give you some references to this part. Um, there is a good book which I recommend um, by... Manton and Sutcliffe, called Topological Solitons, um, quite a recent book. Um, and um, so recent, it's got rubbed out. It's too, I think it's, well, it's, it's maybe I, may I, I didn't know the exact date, but it's only, only a few years old, maybe 2008. Um, and, and then the paper I wrote about magnetic monopoles and hyperbolic space, rather lo old paper, about 1987, um, uh, which is now sort of I've dug up again. But then there's this um, book that I wrote with Nigel Hitchin 
on the geometry dynamics of magnetic monopoles, which is uh, really doing the detailed theory of uh, magnetic monopoles, uh, finding the moduli spaces, using twister methods, and all that entirely in the framework of magnetic monopoles. Uh, and then there's a little book of mine uh, on the geometry of yang mills fields uh, from the Squala Normality in Pisa, where I really work, gave an exposition of the Penrose twister theory, how you can apply it to solve these yang mills equations. So that's the explanation of the theory of twisters as used. In three, it's applied to the problem of magnetic monopoles to get information about that moduli space. Second is the one about the hyperbolic space interpretation, which is, which is a subsidiary part of the story. And then one of the topics is a rather broad survey about topological solids. It says a lot about the skirm model and so on. So all of this is, that's of the general background. There's a lot more references elsewhere which you can find inside some of these. Um, now, I'll stop there. I'm actually going to ask you to go on your questions. But let me just, in here broadly, what I'm hoping to do next lecture, that may change. Because first of all, I didn't say at the beginning that the ideas I want to try to develop are entirely speculative. I've got some ideas which are maybe nonsense. Um, and I'm still exploring them. And I'm trying to find models for the proton and the neutron. And I'm trying different candidates. Every week I change my mind. So you know, uh, I don't guarantee this will be the last version. But, you know, so... So therefore, it's not going to be very polished, and they won't answer all the questions. I'll leave a lot of unsolved questions. But what you will see is not mathematics as a polished article. You'll see it in the raw, you know, while the chef is still in the kitchen cooking his dinner. I mean, you won't see the dish on the table if I mix my metaphors. Uh, and it may turn out that it's not edible. <laughs> you throw it away. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, the nature of mathematical research is such that when you explore something, you have no, no guarantee that you'll solve it or you'll find a correct answer. You have an idea, you explore the idea, it looks promising, you pursue it, and I'm doing that. But this is more difficult because I'm, I'm pursuing a mathematical idea in relation to physics. It's not, not enough that it should be mathematically consistent. It's more important to see that whether it is at all related to real physics. So I have to talk to physicists, and I have to make some input, build a bridge between the one side and the other one, and there are lots of physicists, and they have different views. Um, so it's, it's quite a long story. So uh, it's an ambitious program, um, but I think I've made some pro pro progress, which is why I'm trying to... This is the first time, by the way, I've, this is in a, what they call a world premiere or something like that. Uh, uh, first time I've talked about this in this... Well, I talked about it earlier versions, but that was an earlier model that's probably wrong. This is, you know, Mark II or Mark III, superior version. And so... Uh, but it may change later on as well. But I think I've now got closer to having what I think is a reasonably satisfactory set of mathematical models what I was trying to do. Not entirely finished yet, still some unsolved questions. Uh, then the question is, that's, that'll, I think, the best I can do. If that turns out not to be right for physics, okay, tough luck. But I think, and then I'll offer it to the physicists and say whether, you know, they think it's any use. And the, the answers could be of various kinds. They could say, rubbish, you know, you, it's wrong physics. Or they can say, we knew it already. It's hidden, hidden in our big theory. Or they might say, well, it's an interesting new point of view. Perhaps we can, perhaps we can find a, a, a use for it. So it's all, all very much open. But I've learned some <coughs> things in doing it, which I hope to try to explain, if only briefly. Um, um, for example, I will, I will, this is very, very, very rash of me. I want to try to describe what quarks are in geometrical terms. Um, I don't think physicists think of quarks as geometrical at all. They're part of some mysterious mumbo-jumbo to do with uh, representation theory of groups. Um, I want, I want to, to tell you what, roughly what a quark is. Um, quark is something inside the nucleus. Uh, well, the three quarks. Are, and the question is, what are these mysterious things that the physicists call quarks? And I'll try, I've got, I'm getting close to an answer to that question, especially since they say they, you can't see them outside. They're, you, know, they, they, you, you, you can't... Inside the nucleus, there are nice object objects, Outside, they don't exist. They have fractional charge. Other, everything outside is integer charge. So what on earth are they? And uh, so I hope I get a bit of a geometrical answer to that question. I'll try to persuade you, but uh, may not succeed. Okay, well, I'll stop there. But we'll see if there's any... Wants to ask any questions?
do not be afraid to ask stupid questions. Yeah, as Yes. Ah, very good question. Very good. Very sharp guy there. Um, well, you see, there's, there's where the quarks are going to come from. Um, uh, you see, on the one hand, I, I just told you that that's a very good description of the four dimensional sphere. The four dimensional sphere goes naturally inside there. Well, not only the four dimensional sphere, but the four dimensional sphere with the action of SO3 that I want. And I told you that. Uh, the moduli space of monopoles was represented in there, in that pic same picture, by the, the double covering of the fourth sphere and so on. That, so my man manifold, which came as the moduli space of monopoles, which will, I let the secret in advance, be the prototype model of a proton. Sorry, the prototype of a, no, a proton. My first approximation to a proton will be that manifold with its metric. And it has obviously a relationship to C by C matrices, because the geometry tells you it's C by C matrices. And that will be a relationship with the C by C matrices, which, you, which lead you to SU3. And SU3 is the origin of quarks. And so that's, you'll begin this. So that geometry will be the geometry that helps to, I hope, to explain what the, how the quarks will be thought of geometrically and where the SU3 comes from. One of the, I should have explained, one of the mysteries of physics is physics as well. Let's build this theory along this group, and they pull a group out of the hat here. Let's, you'd like SU2, I like SU3, I, you know, who wants to buy SU5? It's like a market. And then they try out, and then they get the best theory, and that's called the standard theory. It involves, where did SU3 come from for the physicists? Nobody knows. It, it, they just tried different groups, and they found... For me, SU3 comes out of the geometry. Because I start off with the four-dimensional sphere, and the four-dimensional sphere, you see, double covered by the continuity plane, the continuity by SU3, is all inherent in the geometry of four-dimensional space. Yeah, if I just look at the symmetrical objects, yeah. Yeah, this looks like these composed uh, circle, which is the intersection of x, y, z equal to zero, and x squared plus y squared, z squared equal to one. We've got a set circle, right? And then I just make a three-dimensional location. This looks like, I mean, this mathematically, this, this looks like just this object. If I look at the trees, the yeah, yeah. eigenvalue yeah, yeah. is a circle. Not uh, quite. It's not so so it's, it's, the eigenvalue is going to go from one point to the point. It's yeah. like an arc. So it's lambda half, 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 half. It's, no. going, it's lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 equal to 0. Yes. It's a plan. Yes. In 3D. Yes. And then you have lambda 1 square plus lambda 2 square plus lambda 2 it's square equal to 1. It's a unit. Sphere. Sphere. Yeah, right. So it's in the section. Yes, that's right. So lambda one and lambda two is. Yeah, okay, that's right. So then I was thinking the symmetry where you affect the answer. But then you need to get a symmetric three by three yeah. matrix, which is just correspond to location. Yeah. Right, it's a three D location. No, uh, yes, you get you got the three D location. Three, three dimensional. Three dimensional right. location on this diagonal matrix that will give you all the objects. And this like uh, the, the, the the special. Three by three matrix. The eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvalues are circle, right? The eigenvalues for circle or half circle. Yes. Ah, uh, right. Yes. But then you have uh, you have but this uh, three by three location in this uh, in this uh, um, what? First, I look at diagonal matrix. Yeah. Right. It's simple, yeah. and then I just do in location. That will just produce all the three by three matrix. Yes, that's, that's, that's right, but you have to be careful. That's what I'm doing. I mean, that, that is the space of matrices, the orbits are given by the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are parameterized by half, really by a semicircle, which is swing around. That's the description. That was the, that was the picture I was telling you about. Yeah, exactly. So what does this mean? I mean? What does it mean? Yeah, physical, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm just... Well, that, uh, yet, I have made it. Well, the... Um, the... the, the, the SO3, uh, in the end of the day, will be the ordinary rotation in ordinary space. Um, and the, um, well, I mean, that's what I'm trying to find out, what's the relationship to do with physics. I mean, I, 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 I'll tell you a lot more in the subsequent lectures. But basically, there is a lot of geometry from that little picture, which is just pure geometry in one hand, 
but it has an origin in physics because I took my number of molecules and I offer it as a link to physics. So I'm going to get from this a set of models for protons and neutrons and electrons and, and uh, which will all grow out of it. So, uh, you know, the aim is to produce geometrical models of the fundamental part, particles of physics out of pure geometry, totally out of, in a natural way, with all the right symmetries and the right properties, uh, just like God made them. You know, so, I mean, uh, the idea is that this is a totally natural geometrical procedure, nothing artificial. I didn't invent anything new. I just took basic geometry and just turned the handle. Uh, so I think it's better than what physicists do. We should say, you know, let's take this group from the sky and bring it down and do some group theory. Uh, they have no reason to... They have no explanation of where HU3 comes from. This here, this is the origin of HU3 in some, in some way, and then you build on that. But I, I'll... I'll I have to, I've got to think a bit more to answer your question. By, maybe I have the answer by one of the next time. But it's a good question. If you're look, looking ahead, there, certainly. Yes, that 3 by 3 is rated as you 3. Sorry, 2. I have a more humble question. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, you mentioned about... Um, I'll give you a humble answer, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned about these classical solitary uh, equations that are mm. being used for many Yeah. Transforming to the Panabay 2, for example. Yes, yes, yes. Connection. <coughs> Actually, the Panabay 2, Panabay equation come into the. That, that's what so, I want to ask. So, you mentioned about using, using twisted theory to yes. solve the instant size. Yeah. You, you said you can, you can solve it exactly. So, yeah. I'm just wondering what kind of solution you would get. Actually, it's very interesting. You raised that because amongst the various manifolds I'm going to describe, there is one class where, which will describe more or less so-called, what you might call the neutron. And uh, that class is an explicit set of material soliton, which is given by a special set of solutions of the panel of equation. There you are. Uh, and, and this is another beautiful method, work of Lyle Hitchin, which, I mean, he relates the panel of equations to the twisted theory, but it is the solution of the panel of equations which he used. And there are a very special class. The first few are rational solutions. And the, yes. And then later on, there's some other, other, other more complicated ones. And that's, that's a family of solutions which I want to use. So that's a I didn't bring my references with me here. We've run it here. There are panel of 1 to 7 out there. I've got them. It's, the, it's certainly the, the, one of the interesting ones. Uh, and uh, it, it, it also corresponds to other problems about isotopic deformation of three points in the plane and things. But it's a, yeah, that is, so these are really quite explicit formulae. Uh, you can get for the for the, for the manifolds. And so this, if this is my model of the neutron, I will say it's a solution of the panel. You know, very special. So, so you say it's an isomorphism of three points. Yeah. Right? Or probably more than three points. I think it's three points. Three points. I think so. Three points. In addition to the well, you're talking about three more points than the Gauss have the geometric or the mean. I've forgotten. The term, but I'm not very familiar with the terminology. But it's, it's basically it is, it is related to isomorphism around, around three points with matrices. Um, but I'll tell you, well, bring, next time I'll bring the, the nice, very beautiful paper of Nigel Hitchin where this is explained. Uh, but I can wait your appetite by saying that uh, if you, this is following a remarkable fact which he discovered. He proved a theorem some years back. If you want to find a manifold, four dimensional manifold, which is uh, a, a sort of well, it, it satisfies, it's an Einstein mani mani manifold, it's a self-dual manifold, and it has positive scalar curvature, and it's compact. So there are only two answers, the fourth sphere and the complex vacuum plane. That's it. But then he found there were some new solutions coming from this panel of A. Those are two coming from values of the parameter in the panel of A system. If you take the other ones, then you find, you get some new solutions, and you wonder what the solutions are. It turns out these solutions are solutions... Um, which are defined initially in the complex objective plane with the real objective plane removed, where the metric you get is complete and it goes over that, but it acquires a kind of conical behavior there, like an orbifold. So <coughs> the first two are angle 2 pi or pi, by going, they, they, they give you the plane sphere, but the other ones will all give you something which is 
manifold, but it has a kind of cone. You know, you know, in the direction transverse to the RP2, it looks like a cone. <coughs> and that angle of that cone is, will change as you go along. That's, that's, so they're compact. They're solutions of the equations. And they're really, co really manifolds topologically, but they have conical behavior along that RP2. It's very, that way, they, they escape the theorem that says they shouldn't exist, which Hitchin himself proved. So, you know, it's very, very convenient. So th those are the ones that I want to use for neutrons. They are nice ones. And this, you know, yeah. So, Michael, I'm trying to uh, map what you have said into something that, that I can understand better. Yeah, yeah OK. We all have to do that all the time. Okay. Now, say, for example, you know, Einstein's theory of property is basically a geometrical theory. And he said mm -hmm. that if there is mass, then the local metric is distorted. And, and with that, then we can explain all the phenomena. For example, if a photon passes uh, close to a, 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 a heavy mass, then yeah. the, the part photon is distorted because yeah, yeah. the metric there is not flat space, it is yeah, yeah, distorted yeah. space. So is the theory that you are now uh, working on uh, saying that, in fact, the space or space-time we are in have very complex topology or, or geometry structure locally, and, and these these local structure will have some consequences. And, 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 and we, when we as a, 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 as a, a physicist or whoever are making measurements, then we are seeing these consequences as something like protons or neutrons or quarks. Is it what, what you are looking at? Really close. Let me, let, me, let me first of all back off. I originally had more ambitious aims to combine everything here, of course, like this, do, you know, do everything. Einstein's equation, you know. But that, that physicists, you can't do that. Einstein... Gravity and nuclear physics are on a totally different scale. It's so, all right, I forget about Einstein's theory for the moment. But then, look, in Einstein's equations, he said himself, this Einstein's equations are the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left-hand side is about the curvature tensor. Each, it's a beautiful mathematical object. The right-hand side, he said, is a mess, because it represents the uh, stress energy tensor of all the matter that's there, and we don't know what that is. He always found that his theory, he had a beautiful left-hand side, and the right-hand side was, was terrible. So my purpose is to try to understand the right-hand side. I want to get a geometrical interpretation of the right-hand Now, the right-hand side is supposed to come from matter. So I want to get a geometrical description of what matter looks like. And, my, and roughly, the idea is that the matter should be given by little protons and little neutrons are given by little bits of interesting topology with little geometry that are attached to inside the space. And, and you know, So from the outside, you just see a, something that looks like a particle. But inside... There's a lot more structure, and the structure is partly top topological. That's where the baryon numbers come from, and partly geometrical, which depends on these particular metrics. And uh, the story gets more interesting, I shall try to explain later on. And you have to study, of course, not only the, the static objects, but how they move dynamically, how they collide, interact. You know, the, the, the physics just begins; it doesn't start, doesn't end with the static universe. It has to has to move. Uh, and I haven't yet talked about the dynamics, but I hope. So but the idea, generally speaking, is to make the right-hand side of Einstein's equations beautiful by having geometrical models of, of matter. And then when physicists talk about matter, you see there's, there's this duality. Theory. There are two kinds of physics. There is linear theory, which is basically Maxwell's equations. Light, electromagnetic phenomena is covered by linear equations. And there, there is beautiful spectral theory, and spe which is all, all experiments really measure what you see by light. You know, electromagnetic radiation, you bombard things with light, you get reflections, you get... Bad. Everything comes from getting the spectral information by using the linear equations. On the other hand, there are nonlinear things in the world. Einstein's theory is nonlinear, and if I put a small piece of matter, it could be nonlinear. Um, and you can, you can try to extract, get linear information from this thing by bouncing it off, taking, you know, how does it, what is the reflection and so on. All that <coughs> is, is the way experiments are done. Experiments are done by using linear theory and using measurements given by light. Light, electromagnetic. That's the world of measurements. That's the world phys experimental physicists live in. But the world geometers live in, on the whole, consists of curved things. And a curved thing can have a very complicated light, a very beautiful object, but it can give off a very complicated pattern of light signals. And so my hope is that well, when physicists do experiments, they're just looking at a nice geometrical object. But what they see is, of course, a very complicated story because they're seeing it through the eyes 
of electromagnetic radiation. That's sort of an ultimate dream, but we are only in the foothills of that. This is uh, the beginning. But uh, still, our basic idea is that I would like to get a good geometrical picture of, of, of matter as good as I can. And certainly, topology has to be at the heart of explaining where these conserved quantities, barrier number, electric charge, where they come in. We, and then and that, we have that. Various, I, I'm putting together some of those ideas, although I've, I, there's a bit I've hidden so far, which I'll tell you about next time. You might think I cheated, but I, I, not entirely. Um, and so this is my goal. It's a very ambitious goal. Now, I won't live long enough to, to get there. Some young guy in the audience may carry on, carry the torch forward. I'm very happy to have help for anybody who wants to assist. I have some friends, young physics friends who assist me as well. But anyway, anyway, it's, that's, that's the goal. Is there, will you be able to speculate in uh, pr predicting new types of particles? Or? When I first started, every time I found a new manifold that didn't know what to do with it, I said, perhaps that's one of these bits of dark matter that the first astronomers can't find, you know. Uh, and it, I wouldn't exclude that, you know. You know, the physics world at the moment is in a remarkable situation. They have this fantastically elaborate theory. Standard, theory, standard model, string theory, they talk about cosmology of the early universe. And then they suddenly say, unfortunately, we can't explain three quarters of the matter we see in the universe. So we, there's this mysterious thing called dark matter, which we don't know. And there's an even more mysterious thing called dark energy, which we don't know. So really, the, the theory has got a massive great holes in it. So uh, there's room to improve it. And uh, they all speculate that dark matter may be due to some forms of matter which is not baryonic and due to something else, some other kind of particles. And they've all lots of ideas have been thrown around, but nobody knows. So if you're going to produce geometrical models of particles, certainly it would be reasonable to try to find a geometrical model for the missing particles that they haven't seen. Why not? But, I mean, that, that's a bit ambitious, but certainly... Yeah, it certainly would be, it could be reasonable to ask whether this will include unknown particles that haven't been seen. Then you make a prediction, look in the sky, but you won't see it because it's, un it's difficult to find. But I mean, in principle, you might get indirect evidence for it. Well, you can because of gravitational effects. That's the, that's the whole point is that they measure the amount of gravitational attraction and they find it's much more than they can justify by the ordinary matter that's there. Therefore, there must be something hidden. And, and uh, the question is, well, what is that? And... Nobody had, well, there are ideas around, uh, but I, I not, no, but no, 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 agreed, agreed solution. Okay.